Hello and welcome to the Counter-Attack playthrough series. We're going to be playing a game called Atlantic Wall. D-Day to Falez. Falez, Falez, I think it's Falez. Uh, June 6th to the 23rd of August, 1944. D-Day game. Let's go check it out. The scenario we're playing is Scenario 1, Operation Goodwood, The Whole Front in Flames. So uh, Operation Goodwood was uh, the British breakout, or I guess attempt at a breakout, um, from just north and east of Caen in Normandy. So the uh, channel is up there somewhere, you can see it. Uh, so basically they are attempting to just smash through the German lines and get a, a breakthrough here. Um, so I've gone ahead and annotated the uh, map a little bit. So uh, red over here and over here are just the scenario boundaries and then they get a little vague up here, but um, there's also uh, an army boundary drawn. Um, basically the British army over here, you know, I might be using the wrong term, but British army over here and Canadian over here. And so there's a line right here, kind of zigzags, I've drawn it um, down to here. The Canadians are not allowed to go outside this area here, but the British are permitted to go in there. The uh, Allied objectives are to hold more than half the city of Caen um, by counting up town and city hexes that compose that um, city. Um, so you can see it's divided by the river here. So uh, they hold the north edge, but the Germans hold the south. They also need to control the town of Trorn, which I set up the map before we're looking for it. I think it's buried up in here, if I remember from some other World War II uh, Normandy games. And then um, they also have to get a unit south of this black line that I drew on the map right here. So one unit has to get south of the map before the end of the game. And uh, if they do all three of those, they get a major victory. If they um, don't get a unit down here, but they do everything else, they get an operational victory. Then uh, for the Germans, if they prevent all those objectives, they get a major victory. And uh, they win an operational victory if um, they own more than half of Caen or have Trorn. And then if no one does anything, uh, it's, a, it's a draw. This scenario is highly customized from the main rules, especially in terms of the sequence of play. So um, everything you see unfortunately will not be the main sequence of play, but a lot of the steps are the same, just rearranged or simplified. Also, um, the only artillery on the board are uh, these German um, Nebelwerfer battalions. They're spread out along a line along here. Uh, the rest are represented by headquarters. In the full game, you would actually have artillery units, but in this game, each headquarters is considered to be like the artillery park uh, for, for a division or corps or whatever. And um, I'm tracking ammo, or shots, I guess, is a special way of doing it. Over, um, I'm just using these tables, but for each headquarters, there's an artillery piece with the same unit designation. And this shows how much, um, I forget what the term is, but firepower points or whatever. So this is one through four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then there's no like general records track that I can find. So I'm just calling this 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So and then there's one for the allies, similar. Um, so, uh, we'll get going here. Just before we get going, one more thing I want to mention. Um, this is a quarter of a map scenario. This game is gigantic. I think it's like seven maps plus like some beach maps. So this is a quarter of one of those seven maps. Um, I've actually unfolded it to be half of a map. And the reason is the stacking rules for all these guys, it's basically two battalions plus you can squeeze in some stuff. I'll talk about that later, but... Um, based on the stacking rules and my setup area, I could not fit all these units onto the map. The edge of the map, uh, the fold, goes right through here. So I had to extend the battlefield up to here to cram all these guys in. So I don't know what the designer was thinking on that one, but uh, that is how I'm dealing with it. So let's get started. It's the morning of July 18th, 1944. And before the offensive starts, the British are launching a massive carpet bombing using strategic bombers in a tactical role. And uh, so they're going to bomb basically a box from this location down to this location, over to here, um, here, 
and then up to here. So this box. So we're going to roll for every hex that contains Germans and see what happens to them. So we'll start with the upper right hand corner of the box. Um, the scenario indicates how to do this, but I'll go ahead and show a little bit here what's going on. So um, this is a, a field work level two. This is a infantry battalion um, that is taking a step loss as a band there. So it has two steps. That's what those two pips are. It has two steps. Each each battalion has three steps in general. This one also is on its reduced side, so two steps, but by being having this stacked underneath it. Uh, that indicates it's taken an additional step loss, so there's three steps here, and they're in a forest. So if, for each of these carpet bombing attacks, um, there's a little chart. And so basically I'm going to roll a die and um, subtract one if there's two or less steps. Well, not true. If there's a pure armored fighting vehicle in the hex, nope. Um, if there's a entrenchment level um, two which there is, it's kind of field work, so that'll be a minus one to the die roll. And then we'll go ahead and check that table. So like this guy, for example, rolled a six, minus one is five. So it's gonna take one AS and two step losses. So an AS is an artillery shift. And you use that in artillery, you know, when you're fighting with artillery battles. Um, but uh, they're modeling um, this carpet bombing attack with artillery shifts. So. Basically, we're going to throw an artillery shift onto this stack, but also the rules for this carpet bombing attack say you automatically get one, even if nothing happened. Um, and so uh, these will have certain effects. Um, any unit that has two artillery shift markers, besides having some battle effects, um, Basically, they can't stop the enemy from moving. You know, we'll go into all this stuff, but um, their movement allowances are halved. Um, and they'll also affect battle. So, um, and then these are sort of like the effects of the shock of the attack. So they'll slowly wear off. Um, and so I need to take care of two step losses here. So, um, First, I could decide to let this uh, fort uh, or this fortification um, field work absorb one of the hits. So these guys are going to just be blasted anyway. So um, maybe it just doesn't matter. I just I don't know this game enough. Like, is it is this significant enough to keep around, even though there would be only like one guy left? Because there's three steps here. Um, I'm inclined to uh, have this absorb one step then uh, this guy will be reduced and then one of these guys has to take the last hit so he'll take it so we got this that was just devastating there and these artillery shifts will affect ground combat um, I'm using blue here per the instructions normally it would be red since these are on German units but the blue um, is to indicate that these are special artillery shifts not from artillery but instead from the carpet bombing so um, we'll try to power through these now. Just kind of go down the column here. So um, roll on a die. We got a zero. Um, we have uh, two, three steps there. Um, so that's no effect other than they do get their one mandated artillery shift marker. Going down. Um, let's see, we have a step of Nibelwerfers and a pure AFV one step. So there are two or less steps, that's minus one, and a pure AFV, that's another minus one. Roll to nine, that goes down to seven. Um, three step losses and another artillery shift. There's only two steps here. So we'll take a step loss from this guy. Um, dead, I believe so, yes. And then uh, that was one step loss. Take a step loss from this guy. Now he, these units are special. So this is like a company of um, what are they? Mark six Bs. So those are like king tigers, I think. So um, I flip it over, and there are no step pips on here, and it has a circle around it. That's called a Z unit, which I guess means zero uh, step. 
So uh, they survive, even though there were two step losses taken. Um, they effectively have like a remnant of some tanks remaining. So they will go ahead and get their artillery ships. By the way, in the full game, normally I'd be tracking um, losses because they might um, be able to be brought back in as replacements, um, not in this scenario. Okay, next is um, a single step, so that's minus one, got a nine, it's a artillery shift plus three step losses destroyed. Okay, so this is pretty devastating for the Germans, we'll start at the top field work there, got a nine, it's minus one for the field work, how many steps do we have here, one, two, three. Um, so we rolled an eight. Well, I'm just getting high numbers here. So um, that's three step losses. So uh, we'll go ahead and um, destroy this guy. That's one, two, and destroy the field work for three. Okay, and he takes two artillery ships. We'll clean this up a little bit better later. Okay, what do we got here? We have field work, one step, and a Z unit. Got a four, that's uh, two or fewer steps. Um, and an ET2, uh, entrenchment level two, so that's minus two on a four, that's a two. One AS, one step loss. So we'll go ahead and uh, take the Z unit out. Um, throw this back. Got our two artillery shifts coming in. Next, got a, a Puri V and less than two steps um, and a field works. So this is minus three. Uh, got a zero, so no effect. This guy's locked out. No effect except for the mandatory one shift. What do we got going here? Another Puri V, single step infantry. So that's another minus three. Got a five, a two is a one artillery shift and one step loss. Um, I'm gonna take the field works, which again, no idea if that's good or not. Okay, um, what do we got here? That's gonna be a minus one for fewer than, two or fewer steps, we got an eight, goes down to seven, three step losses, boom, yeah. Um, okay, next column over, what do we have here? This is a th level three entrenchment, that'll be a minus two. We got uh, lots of steps, looks like. Oh no, so this guy's one step. So yeah, that's a minus three for having um, fewer than two steps. And having uh, level three entrenchments, so I get rolled a seven, goes down to a four. That's two step losses and an artillery shift. Um, we'll take this Z unit and, hmm, well this guy's going to die anyway, so field work. Okay, and uh, yeah, this is very effective carpet bombing here. Okay, this is a uh, minus one for less than two steps, got a one, zero, no effect, other than the artillery shift. Um, same deal here. Um, no, I don't go that far down on the uh, row. So now we'll go back to the top of the column here. Um, this guy is one step, two steps in a field work, minus two, seven is a five, two step losses. We'll take this. Well, hmm, you know, I'll leave the anti-tank just for fun, just to see what happens when the inevitable assault comes. Two artillery shifts. So field work, less than two, or two or less, I mean. So that's minus, um, it's minus two, 
one step loss. We'll go ahead and take this infantry out. Do I want that? No, I'll take the field work. Um, two shifts. Okay, come down the column. Um, let's see, what row is this? Okay, this is the last guy in the column. So um, it's a level three, so it's minus two, less than a step. So it's minus three total. Roll to zero, doesn't matter. Um, it's one AS. Okay, then we go up to this column. Um, minus one for the field work. Period B minus one. Less than two steps, minus one. So it's a minus three. Got a two, goes down to zero, nothing. Um, just take a little bit of artillery or carpet bombing shock. It's the last guy in the row. This is the next column. Last guy in the column, I should say. Um, how many steps we have here? We got three steps plus, okay, so we got four steps. So it's just minus one for the um, field work. It's an eight, goes down to seven. One AS and three step losses. So that's pretty rough there. Um, okay, this guy will flip, that's one step loss. Um, guess to lose the engineer, that's another step loss. And the field work, that's another step loss. Take a couple artillery shifts. Um, next guy down. Level three entrenchment. Pure AFV. So that's going to be a minus two for the entrenchment, minus one for pure AFV, and minus one for two or fewer step losses. So minus four. It's a six. Minus four is two. One AS and one step loss. Hmm. Hmm. Let's take this infantry. Part of this is I'm trying to leave a mix of units behind to see how they affect um, work in combat. So it's two ASs. Um, it's the last guy here for this column. It's going to be a minus one, minus two, minus three. <clears throat> Seven minus three is four, one AS and two step losses. So hmm, not as a unit. Um, I think I'm going to keep the armor and lose the field work to artillery shifts. Oh, okay. That was the last column. So that was a uh, pretty devastating, almost seemed like they lost the equivalent of a division. Hard to say, probably not, but, um, that was brutal. So now we'll go on to the main um, portion of the game. So as I said before, the sequence of play is massively altered and all the rules have been changed quite a bit. Um, you know, the basic building blocks of the rules are the same, just how you stream them together is different for um, this scenario and actually the first three scenarios. Um, so basically we start with the uh, allied player turn um, and we start the movement phase with them. This is different from, like, as I said, from the normal procedure. Um, and within the movement phase, we start with the air point allocation segment. We do have air points each turn, but um, they're all expended on this turn. They're part of the carpet bombing. Um, then the weather segment. Well, in this scenario, the weather is fixed. Um, this turn, it is uh, dry all the way around. So um, no effect there. Supply determination segment. Um, very rudimentary supply rules in this scenario. Headquarters need to trace um, either to the edge for the Germans or across the Orn, the north side of the Orn River for the Allies, and uh, we start in that situation. Um, construction segment, um, we might be able to construct a bridge, maybe destroy bridges, things like that, but um, I'm not going to worry about that right now. Then the movement segment of the movement phase, where we actually do movement. So um, let's see what we want to do here. I think um, this, these holes in the line here is what I want to look at before I do anything. So basically the full game has a lot of like modes your units can go into and the order of movement matters and you have to choose your modes before movement and things like that. Uh, this is a little more streamlined. Um, so for one thing, um, we move units individually and we can declare them 
um, right before they move as being in uh, tactical mode or prepared assault mode. Uh, tactical mode is just like in most games. That's basically means they've their information, they're moving carefully, but not running around like super fast down roads. Um, prepared assault mode is even more careful, re ready to assault and attack formation. Maybe a bunch of logistics have been taken care of for assault. So uh, before you move someone that's going to be in prepared assault mode, and I'm going to do that, you mark them as in prepared assault mode according to the scenario. Then you go ahead and move them. In prepared assault mode, leg units, which are basically everything that's not wheeled or mechanized, um, can go one hex. There's no movement points for prepared assault mode. Uh, mechanized units um, can go two hexes. Um, there's some restrictions, like if they, they can't go through heavy terrain twice. Imagine they're not like, um, I don't know, they're, they're going carefully. And uh, so also as soon as they butt up against an enemy unit, they have to stop moving. So uh, we'll go ahead and move this guy one hex forward. He comes up against some enemies and must stop moving. So uh, he was already adjacent to enemies. We can ignore that. So uh, he's in prepared assault mode. So I'm going to just hold off on that for a second, though, because I want all his buddies to do that as well. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of force coming down here. Why I'm doing this? Well, um, during combat, I was thinking I can get these guys down here and they can hammer on the stack. Um, maybe make it more difficult for these guys to survive. So I think I'm going to probably do a lot of prepared assaults, which I guess makes sense because this entire operation is a prepared assault. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing here and have these guys all move forward in prepared assault mode. Um, these guys here, well, prepared assault mode gives you a, a bit of an advantage. You forego a lot of movement. This is you're know, basically trading movement to getting some combat bonuses. So I think we're going to call this guy in prepared assault mode too. What are these guys here? You know, <laughs> I've not played this game, so we, you know, this might be silly, but I'm just going to do that. So they're going to go one hex forward, really getting in here. Now this guy's in the Canadian sector, so I'll just let the Canadians deal with them. Um, I have a slot here I can get some guys into. What do we have back here? Some more guards units. Um, I'll go ahead and move them in. So um, that's two hexes away if I make, the, make it prepared assault mode. Um, I might not be able to do that. Let me um, just quick take a quick check. Well, my reading of the rules, it says if you're going to go through more than one of these special heavy types of terrain, which is like woods, this is woods here, um, forests, marsh. Um, if you're doing it through a road hex, it's okay. You can go up to two. Um, I could almost read it as you have to stop as soon as you enter one of them, um, unless they're all through road, but it's not very clear. Um, so I'd say the way I read, read the rule anyway, it's more likely that this is allowed, that I would go um, one hex, and then since there's a road here, I can go one more through the woods. So that's what I'm doing there. Put this guy back where he was. Um, and they were in prepared assault mode. And then these guys here, I'm not going to move them, but as part of the movement phase, I'm going to throw them into prepared assault mode. Um, okay, then on the Canadian front, let's see, we need to get across and start capturing the other side of Caen. So um, I think we're going to do some more prepared assaults. So um, by the way, I, I think I mentioned it, but there's a couple ways to move, and in this scenario a lot of them are removed. But there's um, tactical movement, which is Basically, your units are not using roads and they're fanned out in a formation. You know, if you're going down a road, you might be on either side of the road moving through the terrain. Um, and then there's road movement, which is you're mo more on the road. And there's certain restrictions of what you can do in both of those. And prepared assault movement, if you read through the rules, it, you're pretty much w using tactical movement um, just for an assault. And uh, the reason I say that is because you cannot move into any terrain that you'd be prohibited from moving into in tactical movement, using tactical movement when doing prepared assault movement. So I'm going to um, issue a prepared assault um, orders to this stack of armored units. 
they're going to cross this bridge, which is totally legit as far as I understand. Um, by the way, this game's really complex, so if uh, eSpot errors, please post corrections for me on um, YouTube and BoardGameGeek so that uh, when I make follow-on follow -on videos, I can try to correct them. Okay, and then uh, this guy here, he'll go ahead and make a prepared assault as well to join his buddies. Um, just move in right here. He's staying across the river, though. And, you know, this guy stopped here because he came up against um, enemy units. Be nice if he could have gone there. Uh, infantry unit, uh, they'd be nice to try to cross the rivers. I should have placed my engineers better. Um, I had free reign for the allied setup uh, in terms of individual units. Um, and I had some engineers, but um, engineers can ferry um, units across a major river, which is what the Orne River here is considered. Um, they can't, so... But um, Prepared Assault does give bonuses to combat, so I'm just going to declare these guys are using Prepared Assaults. We'll just assault across that river. I just want to try to obliterate as much as I can, even at heavy losses, while half the board is suffering from uh, that carpet bombing attack. So what's going on here? This is seems to be somewhat strong compared to other areas. We've got three steps of infantry. Do I want to attack there? I think we're going to leave that guy, and these guys will just hang. But um, I'm running out of prepared assault markers, but uh, I think this guy is going to do a prepared assault, and he's going to combine with both of those stacks there. All right, well, I punched and clipped some more prepared assault markers, so we're good there. Um, okay, so how about movement that's not related to prepared assaults? Well, um, I can just do like plain old tactical movement. Um, so moving units up, um, you know, the front line is pretty full right now, but I can try to move units up like this, you know, up against the main combatants. But also there's a few other things I can do according to this scenario. Um, so the rules are a little more restrictive in what you do, but you can, in this scenario, I can mark um, mechanized units as in exploitation mode. Now, the main rules talk about like an entire formation, which might be like a, or subformation, I think, um, of whatever, a division or maybe um, a regiment. I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Um, can only be marked for exploitation, but my reading of the scenario rules is, I, it doesn't matter, I can just mark mech units as exploitation eligible. They just can't be next to enemy units. Let's see, is this mech under here too? Yes. I'm going to mark them for exploitation, where the idea is uh, there's going to be some exploitation phase. The, if these guys are able to clear stuff out or maybe wound them, then these guys can try to exploit. Um, so let me take a look at other exploitation situations that I might want to take advantage of, like if there's a blowout in the front line down here. Um, see, there's, I know Recon can exploit too. So I might as well just mark these guys as ready to exploit. If I discover I have errors, um, you know, when it comes to the exploitation phase, we'll just remedy it. So these are all infantry. I have a bunch of armor back here. Not so sure I want these guys exploiting. I can only mark the things that are not moving as exploitation, by the way. Um, you know, I'll just leave these guys that are way stuck back in the back for not um, as not exploiting. Also, uh, besides mechanized units that didn't move, infantry units that did not move can have a, a special status designated. And I'm just going to try it and see how it goes. Uh, so this stack of infantry I'm going to declare as being in the combat reserve. And I'm just making all the arrows point there, but... Um, I believe that means like they can loan their troops to troops that are actually engaged in battle, you know, elsewhere, for example, these guys, um, to give them a little bit, bit of a bonus. Um, so we'll see if I'm doing that correctly. I think you have to be within two hexes of a battle hex, something like that. I'm not entirely sure from, from memory. So I'm just going to throw these down and then we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, I, th I threw, uh, well, let's see, somewhere over here. I threw one down in the Canadian sector over here, too. Okay, so uh, then we'll just do some plain old movement to kind of fill in these gaps here. So, um, let's see, so this guy, there's a road there. 
let me see what kind of terrain that is. You know, I don't have all the terrain down. Yeah, that's a secondary road. And so I want this guy to kind of cruise down and fill in over here. So um, moving along a secondary road, uh, those guys are mechanized because they have um, wheels on the bottom of their um, NATO icon for infantry. So mechanized on a secondary road is one. So um, we're going to go one, two, and they have 12 movement points. So prepared assault mode, you don't use movement points. Regular movement, you do. So we've gone two, and then that little dashed line is a trail. So a trail, looking that up real quick. Um, it is one if moving through clear terrain, 1.5 if otherwise, so it's clear. So um, this guy's spends another 1.5 movements, got plenty of movement points left, but he's done there. Um, what else are we gonna do? He's guards, 11th guard, so we'll go ahead and do something similar. Let's see, there's another lot of roads up here, so we can see like these guys are just cruising down here. So uh, stacking, don't really talk about it. It's a little complicated, but basically uh, the simplest way of looking at it is you can stack two battalions. And here's a battalion, and this battalion's going on top of it. Um, however, each battalion could combine with a um, it depends on which nationality you're playing, but essentially like a company of support stuff. Um, and so that could mean you can get up to four units stacked there. And then you can also get one more non-battalion unit stacked there. So you could go up to five um, units. And then there's even some special cases where you can even get up to nine. But um, for all intents and purposes, though, we're not going to be stacking more than four or five units. Okay, so this guy, we'll have him come down here. It's getting 11th armored ready to roll. What do we have in here? Let's move these guys up here. Probably should have put them in reserve, but um, it's pretty much filled out here. Now the Canadian sector. Keep the artillery and headquarters back. Might as well move this guy forward. Um, let's see. I guess he'll just go one into clear. Um, using foot or leg movement into clear is one. And then I want to move into, um, let's see, that's light gray. Um, I think that's a town hex, which would be one as well. Um, I think that's true. I actually don't have a color representing, or I don't, my map key doesn't really make it clear that that's a town versus city. I think it's, okay, I guess it does. It's, okay, that's a town. All right. Um, I think that's all the movement we're going to do. Now that the uh, movement phase is over, we are entering the combat phase. Before we do that, let me point out um, that I had destroyed this um, Nibblewerfer battalion during the um, carpet bombing, and it was in a row that uh, the carpet bombing didn't extend to, so I put it back. Um, okay, so combat phase. Uh, first segment of the combat phase is the, um, in this scenario, the attack designation segment. So uh, we have a whole bunch of units designated for attack, all these prepared assault units. Um, so they have to attack, that's one of the aspects of prepared assault. Um, another aspect of it is that you can combine many prepared assaulting hexes together into one attack. But right now we can designate additional attacks as uh, um, just regular ground assaults and those are one hex against one hex. So um, looking around I don't really see any that I want to do. Um, the only eligible spots would be uh, this engineer unit. I'm figuring the prepared assaults will take care of that guy. And then um, these Canadian units on the flank feel they should just hold there for now, so um, I'm not going to have any. Then the next segment is the ground support mission segment, but uh, there is no ground support um, right now. So then we move into the German defensive fire support mission segment. That's a long name, but basically the Germans can use their artillery to try to, you know, bleed the uh, attackers before they get going. And I don't know how powerful the fire support missions are going to be, but so we'll see how it goes on the first one, but I think we're going to target these uh, Canadian um, armored units that cross the bridge into the southern reaches of Caen. Um, they're ready, they can probably do some mayhem there, so we want to try to harm them a bit. 
So first thing we need to um, decide, do we have an observing unit for that target? Well, um, here's a unit from the 272, and we want to use the 272's artillery, which would be um, symbolized by the, their headquarters down there, um, right here, so the artillery park. Um, and according to the scenario rules, the 272 has four points of uh, artillery strength and a range of six, so the range is good. Um, also, uh, the rules for the Nebelwerfer battalions, um, let's see, we got one, or there's a whole row of them down here. These are rocket artillery. Um, one of them is in range. So we can see this superscript on their barrage strength is four, one, two, three, four, so that can reach. The others cannot reach, they all have threes. Um, but they are permitted to contribute to a barrage. So I think we're gonna say the entire strength of the 272's artillery plus this one Nebelwerfer are going to contribute to a fire support mission on this target using this guy as an observer. So. Um, what I need to check is, is the target observed? The observation rules are uh, pretty complex. There's a lot to them, but uh, in this case, it's fairly simple. Um, you have a observation range of one, two, or three hexes. One, if, is the default. And by observation range, like you would trace a line of sight, for example, from the observer center hex to the center hex of the target. Um, you can see one hex by default, two hexes if you're in a city or town, I believe. I guess you're in the buildings. And then uh, three hexes if you're on a vantage point. And uh, vantage points um, are indicated by these red triangles. So there's one there. It must be a hill or whatever, some kind of known, you know, church spire or something like that. Um, and then the kind of terrain um, of the target of observation um, that it's in may make it not observable. Now the rules say that any unit in prepared assault mode can always see its target and the target can always see it. So we're clear here since this guy's there. So this guy is observed. The target is observed. Then we total up the uh, fire support mission points. So uh, for the Nibblewerfer that is three here. For the artillery park of the 272nd Division, its personary rules, which I believe I said was um, four. Let me just double check that. Yeah, four points, so that's seven points. Now the scenario um, has special rules for the size of a mission, whereas the campaign or the, the full set of rules has different settings. But uh, basically, um, the mo we want to make sure we aren't allocating too many points to a mission, and in this case, seven falls below the threshold of all things I would need to check, so um, we'll worry about that later. We then calculate the number of volleys we're going to fire. Well, that's basically the number of fire support mission points divided by eight, so we're less than eight, so it's just going to be one volley. We then total up the die roll modifiers. Uh, it's based on terrain and the kind of units and other things like that. Um, looking at this chart, you know, it's all complex, so I don't want to go into too many details, but um, the deciding factor here is these are pure armored fighting vehicle formations, so um, that limits it to, um, there's a bunch of categories like A through E in the die roll modifiers, and you would pick possibly one modifier from each of those sections. But in a pure AFV situation, you ignore everything, and it's just a minus three. So we're going to have a minus three die roll modifier. Then we go ahead and roll. I'm going to go ahead and sh show the fire support resolution table. Okay, so I'm going to roll a die. It's a zero. Um, this game zeros are zeros and not tens. Um, so it's a zero. We add our fire support strength to it, so that was seven. So um, zero plus seven is seven. Then we subtract three for our die roll modifier, so that goes off the chart. Uh, so the result is nothing. So that was a waste of a barrage. Now um, I need to accommodate what happened here, so we'll go ahead and, uh, so the rules state for the Nibblewerfers 
that we're going to um, mark them with an ammo depleted marker to indicate that they've fired and they can't fire again until the morning turn the next morning turn which is several turns away so um, there's still more Neville of Warfers down here but this guy is not going to be firing again for a while and then um, the 272 um, artillery fired their full strength so we come over to this chart here and just make sure we get that accommodated um, I updated the price point values for the first and second core um, according to the rules of the scenario they have zero on the first turn so 272 goes down to zero as well okay and that's the first fire support um, attack okay for the next attack um, kind of skimmed around and tried to find another um, headquarters so there's the 16th Dufafa. They have a range of six, just like the 272. Um, and I need to find an observer within the same formation. And I think uh, there's one up here somewhere. Let's see. Um, yep, there's a 272, or uh, sorry, a 16th Dufafa unit that can do observation. Um, range is six, so one, two, three, four. So I think we're gonna maybe target this location. It's one hex away, even though they're in covering terrain that's prepared assault so we can see them. There's no nibble verfers in range. Let's see, this one has a range of, just off the edge of the camera here, three, one, two, three. So we'll just go ahead and um, bombard that guy. Let's take a look at what the situation is here. We have pure AFV, then some infantry, uh, three steps some more infantry three steps so that's a total of seven steps in woods so let's check this out okay so I'll go ahead and show you these categories here so first category what's the terrain well it's woods so that's a minus one next category field works there are no field works there so we'll ignore that next category armor and target hex um, it's either pure or mixed so there is armor but it's um, mixed it's going to be minus two, so that's a total of minus three. This one here says, if double modifiers from A, B, and C apply, well, they only apply from A and C, um, only two of them may be used. Okay, well, that's not a problem. Um, unit density, well, there's seven, more than seven steps. This plus two, five or six steps. So there's five or six steps, so plus one. Um, so the more units, the easier it is to hit. So let's see, we had minus three and a plus one, so we're at minus two. Other conditions, the observing unit is not on a vantage point. It's not night. The units are all observed. Um, so it seems like we're good here. Okay, so it's going to be minus two. Sorry for the shakiness there. I rolled a one. That's not going to work out so hot. A one plus the firepower of four is five. Um, we need to get greater than six. And um, yeah, so that was nothing as well. So go ahead and reduce the 16th leaf off of this firepower. Okay. Okay, next, um, we got the 346th division around here. Uh, they're right here. Their artillery park is outside the area of operations for the scenario, so um, they're pretty much safe out there. Um, I believe there's a 346 unit in here. Yes. So how about we'll... This guy was already attacked, so how about we'll do this one here. That stack. So what do we have here? We have uh, pure AFV and seven steps. Okay, so it's going to be the same. That'll be, um, and let's see, it's in woods. Um, so it's going to be um, again minus two. So go ahead and roll. Got a four, four plus four for their um, firepower that I'm allocating. Uh, that's eight. Eight minus two is six. Six is the zero result, so nothing again. 
So it seems like I probably should be like combining multiple headquarters in the attacks. But uh, unfortunately, it's not panning out. Now we do have some other headquarters available. Um, for example, uh, 21st Panzers down here, I believe. Yeah. But they don't have any units capable of observation. So I think that's it for the German fire support um, mission segment. The next segment is the Allied Offensive Fire Support Mission segment. So basically, uh, instead of defensive fire from the Germans, we're doing uh, our own artillery as the Allies. So um, I think we're going to go ahead and start with um, bombarding this guy here on the Canadian front here. So observation units, well, let's see, so we have a headquarters. All the Allied headquarters um, can throw in 12 points worth of fire support, range of six, and then the artillery groups, which um, are represented by these units can throw in uh, 16 points at a range of 7. So let's see if we can observe from a, one of these prepared assault guys. So that's 2nd um, Armored Division or Brigade maybe. Um, it's, they're Canadians but I don't think I can use the Canadian headquarters here. I might be wrong um, if they are assigned to that headquarters. I'll, I'll check that in a minute. But I know these core uh, assets can contribute to the entire 2nd Canadian Corps. Yeah, according to the scenario setup instructions, the 2nd um, Armored Brigade is attached to the 2nd Canadian Division. So they are considered part of that formation, so could spot for uh, the artillery of the 2nd Canadian. Um, you know, I think we'll just use the that division headquarters then. So this division headquarters, which represents the artillery park, is going to bombard here. Um, so let's check out what we have in here. The defenders have three steps, and they're in a fortification. They're also in a um, city. So city is uh, minus four to the die roll. And then fortifications, or field works would be minus two. In fact, I should be showing you this. So, category A terrain, minus four for city. Category B, field works, minus two. Armor and target hex, no. Unit density is a uh, between greater than two and less than five, so no bonus there. Other conditions, um, observing units not on a vantage point. Um, so it looks like minus six. So um, we're gonna use all 12 firepower from the uh, Canadian Second, um, so I just brought them down to zero. So that's uh, two volleys. So um, I may have mentioned this before, but you divide the total firepower by eight. Um, that's how many volleys you have. So that that's um, w one volley and some change. And so the final there's act that you actually round up. So it's two volleys. The first volley will have a firepower of eight. The second one will have a firepower of the remainder, which is four. So um, when we're rolling it to minus six, so might as well show this chart a little bit more and then I'll start doing it off the camera. So roll to one, well that ain't very good. So uh, that's nine, because um, the firepower of eight, then minus six for the uh, city and fortification. So that's a three, three is less than six, nothing. Okay, so then the next volley, this is with four firepower. Got a three, I'm just rolling though on these. Three um, plus four is seven, minus six. Um, so, nothing there. Well, it seems like I should be throwing more artillery into this, but uh, you can only go up to a certain level with it, uh, up to 24 points, I believe. So, um, maybe I should be combining artillery groups a little more cleanly. Um, okay, so I think we'll have this core asset, the ninth Agra, uh, which is right there. Um, 
in his range of seven, so it's fine. Bombard this guy, because since I'm assuming it can support the defense of this guy if they choose to attack this way. So this guy will be spotting, uh, because it's part of the same core. And uh, he's not in pre prepared assault mode, so but uh, so I need to check out the observation rules here. So it looks like it's uh, one hex adjacent across a river with a town in field work. So am I able to observe that? So this terrain feature here is um, considered covering observation covering terrain. So all terrain is classified as how it covers. Um, there's movement covering terrain, so I guess it can mask your movement as you're moving through it, and observation covering terrain. Well, you can't be observed at all, I suppose. So uh, this is observation covering terrain, and only attack designated units may see into that, uh, is my understanding. These guys are not attack designated. So I need to find another observer. Um, doesn't really matter because I'm using core artillery, so I'll just have uh, this other counter observe. There are rules for how many observations you can make um, per counter. Um, I'm pretty sure each battalion can do at least two, but um, I'll just go ahead and do the other battalion, so they will observe for that. Um, and because they're attack designated, that's why they are able to observe. So uh, let's see, we're going to throw all 16 points of that aggro in. Let's see, that's aggro 9, so I'm going to drop its um, firepower points down. It's throwing 16 in, that's two volleys of 8. Um, let's take another look here. So we have two steps in a town in a fortification in our field work. So what do we got going on here? Uh, town minus three. Entrenchment level two is, um, brings it up to minus five. There's no AFVs. It's a uh, two steps, <laughs> so that's another minus one since the, it's not a dense um, environment. So that's minus six. Hey, okay. Um, oop, let's go ahead and roll here. Seven, finally a high roll. So we're, it's seven plus the eight for our first volley, which is 15, then minus six, which is nine. That is one um, hit. Now, I don't know if you take hits first per volley or you can add them all up at the end. So let me check that out. Yeah, we do both volleys um, and then add it up. So let's bring, come back over here. So second volley, got a nine. Um, nine plus eight is 17, minus six is 11. So that's AS1. I think that's an artillery shift with one step loss. So um, yeah, it is. So that is two artillery, or two step losses and one artillery shift. Well, um, we'll go ahead and well, actually, I, I should check. There's some rules for uh, these step losses. I better check this out. Okay, so no matter what, we're taking an artillery shift. Note this is a red artillery shift. That is the color you use for the Germans. All these blue ones over here were special to denote that they're not artillery shifts per se, but um, carpet bombing. So uh, they take an artillery shift, um, which, you know, when ground combat starts, you'll, you'll see what those do. But... Um, you also have to take two hits, and for the first hit, you have to choose if it's going to take be a, a loss or a retreat. If it's a retreat, everyone in the stack must retreat, and they take an additional artillery shift. And uh, if they retreat adjacent to an enemy unit, they can take another loss, things like that. Um, but I think I want to try to just keep the allies bottled up as much as possible, especially since this is a, in call. So um, I'm going to take the first hit um, against the fortification. Okay, and then the second hit, we make a defensive um, proficiency check. So all the units have um, some proficiency. That's uh, you know how well trained they are, combat hardened, whatever. So they have an attack proficiency on the left, and then a defense proficiency on the right. Now, unfortunately, the generic counters that aren't, they're just sort of the breakdown type units, don't have it printed on them. Uh, I'm not sure why, so I need to go look that up.
So the proficiency of both these units is 5. We use the lowest proficiency rating, which they're the same, so it's a 5. I need to roll less than a 5. I rolled a 1. So that means they were tenacious enough to stay in their hex. So I should have read out a little more detail how to do this, because if they had retreated, they could have reduced a step by um, their hits by one, one loss. Um, but they didn't, so instead they tried to tenaciously hold on, which means um, by passing their check, they get to stay in the hex. If they failed the check, they would have had to retreat anyway and still take a hit. So they're taking a hit, you know, so this is a little silly on my part. So um, these combat factors here, it's attack, defense, movement, attack, defense, movement, and then a superscript is the defensive um, anti-tank value. And if there's a superscript on the attack, it'd be their armor value. So I think I'll go ahead and keep this guy. Um, he's not very good, you know, only 50% is good at attacking, but much better at defending. Okay, and they have an artillery shift, so that's that. Okay, for the next barrage, I think we'll do third uh, Canadian division. Um, Quick comment, I apologize if you can hear uh, a fan in the background. Besides just being a noisy environment here, it is sweltering and my animals are miserable. Yes, she's miserable. So she's sitting right in front of the fan. Um, so anyway, sorry about the noise. Um, it's the third Canadian. Let's check this out. So um, I think what they're gonna do is bombard this. These guys are attacking across the river, so let's bombard this um, Volksgrenadier unit. I think that's what that is. Um, armored infantry. Um, they're within range. There's some third infantry um, in prepared assault mode so they can spot. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and use the entire 12 point allotment from third division's artillery park. Plus, um, let's go ahead and take a little bit of 8th Agra, um, which is a core asset and thus can be used. Um, go ahead and round that out to 16, so let's see, 8th Agra is contributing 6. Um, did I do that right? No, 4. They're going to contribute 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm adjusting their points. So by doing that, um, we have 16 firepower coming in, which divided by 2 is or excuse me, divide by eight is two volleys. So we're gonna bombard these guys with two volleys of eight. I'm just hopping over to the uh, chart here. So um, what's the situation here? Well, they're in a city minus four. Is that correct? Yep, city minus four. Um, level two entrenchment, so that's minus six. Um, no AFVs. It's only one step, so that's minus seven, unfortunately. Um, okay, so let's volley number one. It's a seven, minus seven is zero, but plus eight for the firepower. So uh, that would be an eight. That's an artillery shift. Okay, let's do the next volley. A four, four plus eight is 12, minus, what was it, seven? Um, it's five, too low. Okay, so we, all we got was an artillery shift on these guys. Um, you know, that'll help when the ground assault comes though. So, uh, here we go. Okay. I think we'll use um, eight agras remaining on this stack here. So that's going to be a 12. We'll go ahead and spot with these or these guys. So um, third Canadian, which is part of the second Canadian core, which is this whole region. This is a second Canadian core asset. So um, if that grid goes down to zero, that's 12 firepower. Um, I don't think I have any other uh, headquarters around here that could, could have helped with that. The rest of my headquarters are British, I believe. So we'll just do a 12 bombardment. Probably should have saved the 16 for this guy. But uh, 12 bombardment, we got uh, three steps. So there'll be no pro or negative for the unit density. Sorry here, what are we trying to see here? So that's a clear area with, um, looks like a village or something. So I need to look at the terrain chart. 
that is a village a village um, in terms of defensive s strength for artillery oh well I got it here so uh, village is minus two so this isn't gonna be as bad uh, minus two for the level two entrenchment though it's gonna be minus four total um, we're gonna have two volleys one is only at four strength though so let's go volley number one that's a six um, so six plus eight is fourteen um, fourteen minus four is ten one hit okay and then we'll do the four strength volley it's a four uh, four plus four is eight eight minus four is two up so um, we did one hit so the defender gets to choose is that hit going to be a retreat or a normal hit? Now, um, for these guys, I'm inclined to um, just take the hit and be done with it. They are going to... No. Um, oh, I was going to say they're going to take an artillery shift, but that's actually not true. So they're just taking a hit. You may recall we did a proficiency check on the uh, earlier. Uh, that's only when absorbing the second hit from a series of hits. Well, we only have one hit, so the, with one hit, you just take the hit. Um, so we'll go ahead and I guess flip this guy here. Ooh, that's a big loss, but that's okay. We're, we're still, we got several steps here. Okay, that's that. I think we'll go over to the other flank and start processing um, first and eighth British Corps artillery barrages. So, um, if I can recall here, there's a fairly strong unit here, but it's also taken a step loss already. But um, So it's down to one step. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and bombard it, though. Um, so what can we do here? We have... Well, I should see what potential spotters there are. So right here, um, that's 79th Armored 3rd British Infantry. So uh, up here is 3rd British Infantry Division, so we'll go, we, can, we know we can do this. Um, they're in woods. Um, they attack with twelve fire, up to 12 firepower, so I think I'm going to do that. And then take um, 4 from Agra number 5. And uh, is that what that is? Yeah, 5th Agra. So I'll take 4 from that. 1, 2, 3, 4. And that bumps it up. Uh, to two volleys of eight. So um, go ahead and do this. I'm going to do it off off camera now. I'm not going to show you the chart. So I rolled a two. Two plus eight is ten. Um, we're in woods, so that's um, minus one is nine. And the, it's not a target-rich environment. It's uh, less than two steps, so it goes down to eight. That is an artillery shift. Then I'm going to go ahead and do another seven. Uh, 7 plus 8 is 15, minus 1 for woods is 14, minus 1 for low unit density is 13. That equates to 2 hits. So 2 hits and an artillery shift. Okay, so that's that's good. Um, now this guy already has 2 artillery shifts. Even though they're from carpet bombing, they, they count as artillery shifts, and the most artillery, artillery shifts you're allowed to have is 2. So, um, but this guy is only has one step left. It's gonna have to take two hits. So no matter what, it's um, hurting here. So I think what we're gonna do, um, I, I didn't do this earlier and really just didn't describe it because I'm trying to roll out the rules bit by bit, but um, he is going to attempt to retreat. A retreat um, can go to here or here. Um, when you move retreat adjacent to an enemy unit, um, which I guess we're not, but uh, as long as you're retreating in movement covery, movement covering terrain, which woods are, uh, you don't take an additional hit. So um, question is, do I want to go here or here? I guess we'll just go here. Okay, oh, I should take my step loss with me. So that absorbed one hit. Um, when you retreat, you're supposed to take another artillery shift, but we're at max. So um, now we have to do our proficiency check since we retreated and there's more hits to be applied. 
So uh, remember that's the roll less than this number here. So we got a nine, so it failed the proficiency check, which means we, we can't cancel out a hit by retreating. So we have to take the hit. Now, we're only one step, so if I took it as a step loss, I would die, but uh, I didn't mention this earlier that instead of a step loss, you may take a fatigue. There's several levels of fatigue, and basically the more fatigued you are, the worse you are. So, um, you know, if this guy's gonna die, I might as well just fatigue it. At least it's a little road roadblock there. Now before I finish this off though, I'm just checking the rules to make sure I got everything. Um, you know, there's a lot of rules to this. You must always take one real hit before you can start taking fatigue. So we're gonna take our one real hit and die. So, at least you learned about fatigue. That guy's dead. Now since the fire mission cleared out this hex, any attack designated units next to the hex may advance. Um, you can't like keep attacking and advancing, um, so uh, you can only advance once. Um, so I think this entire stack is going to move up. So this is movement covering terrain here. Um, so if I wanted, I could also revert to tactical mode and remo remove prepared assault mode. Um, the reason you might want to do that is if you advanced next to an enemy where the combat odds are no longer good. Um, you could remove this because prepared assaults or designated attacks must go forward. So these prepared assaults are required. Um, but you know, it's overwhelming power coming in here, so um, I'm going to leave it like that. Okay, next barrage, I think. Um, let's see, we have the uh, Guards Armored Division headquarters here with 12 firepower points available. Let's go see if we have some guards down here. Um, I think we do down in here. Yep, there's some guards, so they're gonna spot. Um, might as well just bombard this guy with all, well, what do we have here? Um, it's got two shifts, pretty wimpy anti-tank unit. Um, okay, and then what do we have down south? Well, do we have any, there's some guards there. This guy. Um, two steps. You know, I think we're going to bombard that guy instead. So this guy's going to uh, spot. These guys are in, in let's see, a little oval circle. I don't know if that's a village or something even smaller. Um, fix that up in a minute. Um, number of steps is two. Um, we're in range. So I'm going to drop the guards from 12 to 0 firepower available. And then I'm going to take a uh, fifth agra again and drop it by 4. So let's see, it's at 12, so um, that goes down to 8. So um, we have two volleys coming in. And uh, let me look at the train. That is a location, the little open circle. So uh, locations um, are minus 1 on the train for um, fire support. So we're looking at minus 1 for the location. And minus one for low unit density, so that's minus two. So this is going to be a big one, hopefully. I got eight. Eight plus eight is sixteen. Minus two is fourteen. That's two hits. And then we'll do the second volley. That's a four plus eight is twelve. Uh, minus two is ten. That's another hit. So three hits. So uh, trying to preserve units here since they. If I just took three hits straight to step losses, these guys would be dead. Um, we'll take our first hit as a retreat. And that will hopefully cancel out a hit. So we will retreat to here. Now one problem, I, I just can't remember anything and you know, they, we could have had proficiency numbers printed on these, um, but I have to go look them up real quick. Okay, the um, Folks Grenadier, uh, six proficiency, this unit's five, we have to lose the lowest, so I have to roll less than five. Rolled two, so we successfully um, canceled out a hit. Um, we took our first hit as a retreat, canceled out a hit. Um, with, through the act of retreating, and then we have one hit remaining. And uh, 
I have to take the hit, um, the, the first of the remaining hits, as a step loss. So, yeah, this guy's dead. Okay, but uh, we did get this guy out of dodge. Has two artillery shifts on it still, though. Okay, next barrage, we have a um, headquarters for 11th Armored. Um, this, these are the units, like, way back here that I just kind of got, you know, I didn't have much room for them, so I just stuck them back there and didn't really think about them. So, um, they don't have any spotters, so they cannot barrage. Um, and uh, they have some units within two spaces of a, uh enemy, but um, they would have to be on a vantage point or in a town or, or city um, to use their, the higher terrain to spot, and they they can't. So, um, but we still have, looks like 16 firepower plus 8 firepower, so 24 firepower of Agra stuff remaining. Um, now we can't bombard a, a unit twice, but I'm inclined, well that's in the Canadian sector over here, can't do that. I'm inclined to throw it all in on one more guy. Let's see. You know, I think I'm going to do a little on this and then a lot on this. Um, is that what I want? Maybe a lot on this. Yeah, we'll do a, we'll do a lot on this. Hmm, although this guy can go here. Maybe that's better. Okay. This stack, which contains core assets, is going to spot this location, which is a little deeper into the German defenses. It's just got a little wimpy guy in there, so, um, and he's in woods with a location, or no, a village. So, um, I think we'll go ahead and use eight, uh, what is it? Fitz Agra's eight remaining firepower, so that'll be a single volley. Um, it's in a village, so it's gonna be minus two. Low unit density, total of minus three. It's in a field work, so that would be um, a total of minus five. So eight plus, I rolled a five. So five minus five is zero, plus eight is eight. That's an artillery shift. Um, these guys already have max artillery shifts, so they lucked out. And then the remaining agra, which has 16 firepower, that's um, fourth agra. Um, I guess it will go after this guy here. So it's got one step, it's in woods, so uh, woods minus one, low, low unit density minus total of minus two. Um, we're going to do two bombardments. Bombardment one, I rolled a six, plus eight is 14, minus two is 12. That's an artillery shift, it already has max, and one hit. Then the next one, eight plus Eight is 16 minus two, that's 14, two hits. A total of three hits coming to this guy. Um, the first hit has to be taken as a step loss even if it retreats and all, yada yada, so uh, it is dead. Okay, and then units, attack designated. We're adjacent to it, may advance, so we'll go ahead and let these guys advance. Okay, now they're adjacent to these guys. Um, by the way, when you advance, you can't spot. I believe that's correct. Um, so, go ahead and clean this up. So all the artillery bombardments are done. Okay, now it's the attacker adjustment segment. So this is where attack designated units can attempt to cancel their attack orders. Uh, it's basically a um, proficiency check using the lowest proficiency unit in the stack. Um, it's also automatically canceled if you're not adjacent to enemy units. So this guy, for example, that stack's attack designation is removed. Um, looks like everyone else that is attack designated is adjacent to an enemy unit. Um, I could attempt to remove some attack designations, but um, I want to try to make some headway. Um, so. I'm not going to do that. The only one I might remove, and it's just because I do not recall the rules, is um, this guy over here. Are these guys going to all contribute to defending against him, perhaps? Um, 
So that might be the only one I might try, but I'm not going to. Next is the ground assault segment. This is where the finally we get to ground combat. I think we're going to go with this spot first. You pick a hex designated as the defending hex. I'm going to do... Um, hmm. Hmm. Maybe we'll do this one, actually. Do the, have the Canadians attack here just to see what happens. Um, remember, there's an army boundary here, so I want the Canadians to take care of the business over here. Let's take a look at what's in this hex. It's got two artillery shifts. Well, I'll try to remember that and just move these out of the way. It has an anti-tank unit, one, two, with a four superscript in open terrain. Okay, so there's a lot of steps. So um, we identified the defender's hex. The next is we find the defender terrain line. So we know it's clear. So come over to this little chart over here. So we can see clear says line one there, and you can see like line two, three, four for a bunch of other terrain. So we remember line one, and then we come down onto this chart and find out where line one is. So you can see this is gonna be an interesting looking combat results table, has large numbers in it. Uh, but line one will be this row here. And uh, this is the attacker section. And then down here we have the defenders um, section. And there's also a line one there. So we'll be using those line ones. The next step is identify attacking units. Well, I'm gonna use all those guys, but uh, just to be clear, let's take the prepared assault markers off here for a second. Um, we have these two Canadian infantry across the river here. They're going to be participating. And then um, we have a couple more infantry with anti-tank. So I'm going to, all those guys are going to participate. I, I don't have to do all of them because um, these prepared assaults, um, I assume I could have said, well, I'm only going to do this guy. Um, so there's that. And then identified the defending units while well, they're right there. So we need to make sure everyone's attack eligible. For example, armor cannot acro attack across a river if it's unbridged or there's no f forward, that kind of thing. Um, everyone's eligible here though. We then check for surrender. So uh, if this guy was isolated, he might surrender just as the attack starts rolling. Uh, then you declare whether your armor units are going to um, take part, uh, fight in a standoff roll. So I guess there's... They're not spearheading the attack, they're like laying back and providing support, I suppose. There are no armored units here. Uh, remember, that I said there's a superscript for armor on the attack strength, and then there's a superscript for anti-tank strength on the defense. Um, defense, I suppose, is always standoff, or basically you don't care about stand standoff status for um, anti-tank. There's also a few other things you want to check uh, that are not occurring here. Do bridges collapse? Is it night? That kind of thing. Okay, next we want to um, total, uh, hold on, is this not focusing? Uh, total the um, attacker and defender's um, ground assault values. Basically for the attacker, you total up the attack combat strength and the defender the defense strength. Then you do some adjustments to them, for example, terrain. I was looking up the adjustments for terrain and realized the major river, which is the Orne River, and the only way, reason I know it's a major river is because it says it in the rules, and I can't quite tell the difference between major and minor rivers. Um, you can't actually attack across a major river. I don't believe that's true. I'll double check, but uh, that's my reading. Um, so let's just assume that for the moment. So we have 7 and 7 and 2. So um, that's 16 coming in on a defense of 2. So the ratio is 16... Uh, to two, that's eight to one. So then we cruise over to our ground assault combat results table. And we're looking for um, eight to one on line one here. And let's see, it kind of skips over to this side here. So we can see uh, the best we can do on line one is six to one. Looks like if on other ones you can get eight to one, but that is not the case here. So we got, um, let's see, I guess I'll use a die for that, just to point it out. So we're on six to one right there. Next we have to calculate um, shifts, which is pretty traditional in uh, wargaming like this. So we're gonna um, shift this column left or right, depending on the situation. 
So there's a bunch of things you go into, but basically if you're in prepared assault mode, you get a positive shift, so the attacker it would shift this way, but there's nowhere to go. So we're at the limit of the table here. Um, if there are artillery shifts on the enemy, yes, there are, so it would shift this way um, for the two shifts. Um, if there are... Um, Let's see if you're either side as engineers, um, there might be some shifts. Um, if they're overstacked units, some negative shifts. If there's more than one formation in the attack, um, or possibly a defense, there'd be some shifts. Um, that's not the case. Um, there's a bunch of other things like that. Um, so basically, we have a whole bunch of shifts. You subtract the defender's uh, favorable shifts from the attacker favorable shifts end up with, in this case, it would be a bunch of shifts in favor of the attacker, but we're already at max odds here. So that is the final assault value according to the rules. Next, each side is going to roll two dice. Um, the rules say to use two colored dice and pick one as like the tens and one as the um, hundreds. So, uh, or excuse me, the, the ones. So uh, we'll call this ones and tens. So green is ones. I'm going to roll for the attacker. We have 92, so that sounds pretty good. Um, I don't know what that means yet, but um, we'll just try to remember 92. Okay, and then the defender, they got 33. 92 and 33. Now for each of those die rolls, we're gonna look at the situation and add or subtract from the roll. So the first thing, sorry this is a little tedious, so I'm just going to go through it carefully here, is a combat reserve. So I believe I set up a combat reserve for the Canadians here. So remember we were marking things, um, combat reserve back here, so what do we have here? We have an infantry unit that's in combat reserve. Um, so up to three uh, units in combat reserve um, can participate in a battle and they must be battalion sized, have at least two steps. Well, this guy is battalion with three steps. Um, must be attached to the same formation. Well, this is third Canadian, third Canadian. Um, can't be out of supply, out of command, meaning it would be located on the other side of this core or boundary line. Um, can't have a level two, one or two fatigue markers on it. Has to be within three hex, the defending hex. It is, it's within two. And it has to have some type of infantry symbol on it. Uh, and it does. So that gives us five bonus points. So for every infantry that meets that criteria and that we're allocating to this attack, that's five bonus points to the attack. The defenders don't have any combat reserve, so we don't have to worry about that. So um, I'm just going to help myself remember five by putting a marker on a, one of these charts over here. The next category of bonus is a regimental integrity bonus. And basically units that are of the same regiment, so there's sort of a nuance to the definition here. Um, basically, if you meet a certain constraints of more than one unit from the same regiment attacking in the battle, you get a bonus. Uh, basically, the regiment must be represented by at least two units. Um, you can't use them in more than one battle. Each regiment, um, each regiment can award no more than three rib points, is what they're called. Um, so, and each one gives three, so um, let's just say, let's just pretend these two infantry here were the same regiment. Um, they would each give three rib bonus points, so that'd be a total of six. Um, and you can't have more than nine because I guess the reg regiments are composed of three units, uh, usually. So, um, but anyway, if I was setting up the board properly, because, you know, I just can't remember all the rules, so um, I would have remembered to have both of these guys from the same regiment. So, um, in this case, it's Brigade, I suppose, 9X, so that's 9th Brigade of 3rd Infantry, and 7X. So they are not of the same formation. They're of the same uber formation, but not the same sub-formation. So there is no regimental integrity bonus. But if uh, 
9x here was attacking with 9x here, let's say, just say these guys were able to attack, we would get six rib bonus points. Um, put the 7x under there, and what's this? An 8x here would not have contributed anything because the rest of their regiments are scattered because I was stupid. I don't know if that makes sense, but there is no regimental integrity bonus here. Next, we can compute bonuses for um, armor and anti tank values. <clears throat> However, there are no um, armor units participating in this battle. So that cancels that process. And I lost a unit here, so there's the anti-tank unit. So both sides have anti-tank units, but no armored units, so um, nothing's going on there. So I guess the anti-tank fights the armor, you know? We'll, we'll see that hopefully in another battle. Next, there might be proficiency bonuses. So um, each attacker and defending group um, picks a lead proficiency unit. So this is like, maybe it's the unit leading the charge or whatever. So I'm going to the, remember the attack proficiency on the left. So we'll go ahead and pick um, 9x here for its 7 proficiency. And this guy has no choice. It's 5. You take the higher from the lower. So 7 minus 5 is 2. So these guys get a bonus of 2. So we'll add that to the bonus of 5 that we got um, earlier. The bonuses. So then we adjust the die rolls. So any attacker bonuses, which there are 7, get added to both die rolls, which is interesting. So let's see how this goes. So the 92 for the attacker goes to 99, the 33 for the defender goes to 40. And then same way, any defender bonuses subtract from both die rolls, but there weren't any defender bonuses. Okay, so let's process the results. So we'll look at the attacker section first. So the attacker had, um, on this column, 99, so greater than or equal to 98 here. Come over to the right-hand side. Um, that's gonna be three discretionary losses and three mandatory losses. Um, and there's a bunch of rules about how to process these, but it doesn't really matter in this situation because there's only one step available to take a loss and it must take a loss. So um, this guy's dead. Well, then we have to process the um, defenders as well, hits as well. So the uh, defenders result, um, is off the table so um, it's not clear to me what you do there I'm assuming it just means no effect on the attacker um, so uh, then the attacker since the enemy's hex is vacated can advance um, leg units can go up to two hexes um, and mechanized, which this is, because it's got the wheels, can go up to four hexes. You always have to go go through the enemy's initial hex if it was a um, retreat, but no one retreated, they were eliminated. In that case, you can enter their hex or an adjacent hex. Well, we only got one spot, really, that we care about. So uh, let's go ahead and advance this infantry. Now, there's some rules about uh, the advance that limit how far you can go, even if you can go to, for example, advancing adjacent to a, an enemy field work, you have to stop. So we'll just advance everybody forward one hex. Okay, and I'm gonna kind of turn this like this to indicate they've already attacked. In fact, there's no reason to keep it, so I'm gonna take it off. Okay. Now these guys over here, they um, were probably a mistake on my part because they're on the other side of the major river. So um, they're prohibited from crossing it, which means they're prohibited from attacking across it. Um, so we'll go ahead and get rid of that. Okay, so let's come down to these guys here, these uh, Canadian armored units. Um, two are on the same side of the river as this guy. The other is across the river. And if you look at the hexes, um, it will be ac attacking across a major river. So this guy here cannot attack. So it's just these two guys here. So yeah, I kind of screwed up a bunch there. 
So uh, let's go ahead and process this one. So um, identified attacking and defending hexes. Um, actually, I, they don't have to attack this way. They could attack this way. But I think that's what I want to do. I want to clear this out so these guys can go, you know, move around here. So um, it's a city. It's fairly substantial unit in a fortification. So this, this might be brutal here. So let's find the terrain uh, line and the column to start with. So um, the terrain is going to be city. The attacker's attack strength is 15 and 15 is 30 against 6 defense strength. So uh, let's check out, so 30, um, there is a combined arms rule, which of course I didn't really grok until this moment. Uh, which basically pure AFB units need to be stacked with a, a few other kinds of units, um, one of a few other kinds, um, in order to be effective in heavy terrain. You know, the classic tanks attacking into a city need infantry kind of thing. So uh, their attack strengths are halved uh, just for that. So that's going to be 15 against 6, and I'm not sure what the field work does here. Um, this is looking bad. And then the terrain is uh, line 4 for city. So lines 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and then um, I still need to check out the field work, but 15 to 6. Well, that is uh, basically 2 to 1. Um, there. So this is not looking good. Okay, now for some column shifts. Um, well, the, uh, there's no leaders. There's, um, multiple formations. No, there's no penalty for multiple formations because, uh, this is all from the same formation in the attack and the defense. Um, adjacent defenders, okay? Uh, I'm just reading through the rules here. Adjacent defenders, there are adjacent defenders. So, uh, the attacker is adjacent to two other defenders, and they could support the defense. However, it says if they're in movement, if the attack is in movement covering terrain, then they could only contribute if they're adjacent to the target, which they are not, so they cannot assist the defense. Now, if this guy was here, since even though this guy's in movement covering terrain, he would be able to assist. And uh, if it's in movement covering terrain, it would give um, a one shift um, in favor of the defender. Otherwise, two shifts, I believe. But anyway, um, they can't contribute. I suppose these guys cruising through the city streets, and these guys don't really even see the units moving this way. It's sort of how I'm imagining it's modeling. Now, there's no... Engineers, um, commandos, and, or any of the other things that might cause column shifts. Okay, now for adding up um, die roll bonuses. So we'll do this before we roll. Um, so first, uh, combat reserve. Well, there is some combat reserve up here. Um, it's within three hexes, if you remember. Let's see if they're infantry. Yes, two infantry units. So uh, each one of these can contribute to the to the attack. Um, so that will be ten bonus points for in favor of the attacker. Um, defender has nothing like that. And then uh, regimental integrity. Well, the attacker. By the way, these have to be from the same formation. It says second. Infantry, 2nd Armored Brigade, but this is attached to 2nd Infantry, so it's effectively the same formation. Um, so, I should, and actually before I move, in, move on, let's just remove this combat reserve since it's been used up, and I removed it from the one I used in the other battle as well. Um, so, Regimental Integrity. This guy's not participating. Um, we have two units from the same formation here. Um, therefore, 
they have regimental integrity, three per unit, so that's six. So I'm going to go ahead and record that off to the side here. Um, next um, is armor and anti-tank. So the defense here has no anti-tank, or at least as a zero. So maybe that does count as anti-tank. Yeah, my reading is uh, this counts. It's just a zero um, anti-tank value. So um, we have to pick a lead unit. They're effectively the same as far as I can tell. So um, anti-armor value. Uh, where are we? Armor value of this guy and the superscript is four. So um, we pick that lead unit and then we're going to subtract the lead unit, which is here, um, zero, so that's a total of four. Then we have to account for the terrain, how suitable is it for tank and anti-tank. So um, the entire terrain here is city, there's no choice to make, the defender would make a choice if there's a couple choices. Um, and we also have this field work, so we come over here, and this little chart here, we're in a city, so we have to modify the um, net um, armor bonus, which was 4 minus 0, 4, by minus 3. So it's now only 1. Also, in a city, the max it could possibly be is 1, which makes sense. You're fighting in narrow roads. Um, but unfortunately down here, um, entrenchment level 2, minus 2, goes below 0. So we cannot take an armor bonus. Each armor bonus we could have got received um, would give 10 um, points to the die roll modifier per bonus. Finally, we do a proficiency check. We're going to pick the proficient unit, lead unit. It doesn't have to be the same as the armor bonus unit. It doesn't really matter. They're the same, so we'll do this. Seven. This guy's defending at six, so um, that's a one point bonus for the uh, attacker. Okay, so let's roll now. We'll do the attacker first. Um, the attacker is going to have a um, eight point bonus, I believe. Does that sound right? I must have knocked my tracker, but basically it was ten points for um, uh, combat reserve from those infantry, six points for regimental integrity, one point for proficiency bonus. Um, so I'm going to use a green die as the tens. Rolled a forty. Um, 40 plus 17 is um, 57, so let's remember that 17. Uh, 57 on the 2 for 1 column, um, so the way you read this is from 30 to 64 you would be on this row. So I would have needed to get 65 to go to this row, so um, we're on this row, come over here. That's a asterisk, which is a proficiency check. Oops, you might want to see that. Proficiency check on the defender. That's not that great. Okay, now let's roll for the defender. Again, green is the 10, so I rolled a total of 10. 10 plus 17, which was the attacker's benefit, is 27. Come down here on the 2 to 1, line 4, 2 to 1, 27. So this line here, two discretionary hits and one mandatory hit to the attacker. Ooh, that's brutal. So let's go process these. So one thing I missed is when you're defending in a field work, fort, or other kind of thing, a similar thing, your proficiency rating is plus one, up to a maximum of eight. Um, that wouldn't have affected things, it would have just sh taken one point away from the, one bonus point away from the attacker and the way the charts worked, it wouldn't have mattered. So, uh, but this guy needs to roll less than seven instead of less than six to um, satisfy the proficiency, proficiency check. So um, it rolled a four, so it, fulfilled the check. Um, if it failed, it would take a discretionary hit. 
Um, we'll figure out what those are in a minute because the attacker is taking some. So it looks like this guy just uh, wasted, you know, expended some ammo and that's the worst that happened to them. So now the allies. So we have to take one mandatory hit and two discretionary. So you have to process the mandatory hits first. The maximum number of mandatory hits is one per unit. Well, there's only one. So one of these guys has to take a hit as a step loss. So, um, and in fact, there's a priority to what units take them. Uh, essentially, the lead proficiency unit in this case um, must take the first loss. So um, it's going to flip to its reduced side. That's not what I planned on. Okay, now for the discretionary hits. So the discretionary hits, basically uh, each hit, and there's two, requires the entire stack to retreat one hex per hit, or we can try to make a proficiency check to um, ignore the retreat and instead take step losses. Well, I don't want to do that. These are some powerful units here and they're already getting worked, so um, that means I have to retreat two hexes and um, the max you, you can retreat is four uh, for mechanized units. And there's a bunch of retreat priorities, but I think it's pretty clear which way I have to retreat. So boom, boom, okay. You might be wondering if the defender could advance into that hex. The answer is no. You have to be attack designated to do an advance. So um, that was not what I expected, but hey, I threw tanks into a city expecting them to push out fortified defenders. Okay, next attack. Um, let's move on over to these prepared assaults. So um, I think the order matters here because if these two guys attack here, which I might want to do, this guy is adjacent to an enemy unit, so there'd be some potential negative effects there. So I think I'd rather have these four guys all assault here first. Okay, and they can do that. Prepared assaults are the only kind of assaults or attacks that um, can combine multiple hexes. I didn't have any normal attacks. I guess they're called tactical attacks. Um, those can only be one hex to one hex. So uh, let's check out the defender's terrain. It is clear. They've got a couple artillery shifts here. Um, they have an anti-tank value. Okay, so let's check out all these attackers here. Um, man, this is a lot of stuff coming in here. So, um, might as well use everybody. So there's 14. I need to check the terrain, okay. Um, 14 plus uh, 8 is... Uh, 22. Okay, now we have combined arms here, so this doesn't get halved, so that's 37. Um, 41. I need to see if this guy also needs to pair up with someone real quick. Nope, the mere presence of infantry type unit uh, does it, so we're at 41. Um, here's another pure AFV, um, and we have some engineers here, so that helps. Um, so that's 45, 49. Um, here's some pure AFVs. No combined arms there, so um, that was 49. And here we have 15, 18, um, 27 divided by Two is uh, 13.5 plus 49. That is um, 62.5, I think. Hopefully, I'm doing that. I am horrible at simple math. So that's everyone. So we got 62.5. Um, now I need to figure out how to round uh, the fractions. Do I round up or down? I'm guessing it's down. Uh, it's to the nearest whole number, so um, I'm going to call 62.5 is 62. So that's the attack strength coming in. The defense strength is two. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to do all that work because, uh, you know, the max column shift is gonna be six um, because um, we're in clear terrain there. And that means line one, we've already gone through this. Line one, max column shift, six to one. So now we're gonna do, um, 
the bonus is, I think it's safe to say, um, no matter what, we're not going to get off this column. It's all going to be pressed up against this side. So um, one thing I'm supposed to do when I have armor is declare if I'm going to use it in a standoff roll, which would cut it down in uh, cut it in half in terms of its attack strength. Uh, but then we wouldn't have armor versus anti-tank going on. But I don't care. Um, I just there's so much power going into this attack. We're here. Okay. Now for the die roll bonuses. So uh, for bonuses, um, combat reserve. You have to be within three spaces. Um, this one is not. Uh, this one over here is. However, these are Canadians. They're from a different formation, and there's nothing that can apply to. So. Um, we'll check that. Um, regimental integrity. So, uh, here's the regiment, um, is 32 G, 32 guards. Um, so there's one, two, three. Oh, that's tank. So, uh, the rules say it must have some kind of infantry symbol on it. So it's only two. Uh, two is six points. Um, so I'm writing that down somewhere. That's three points per regimental integrity bonus. Um, we have 5th Guards here, which has an infantry type symbol on it, but uh, no other infantry that's from 5th Guards. Um, nope. So uh, that makes me realize um, I made a mistake back over here. Those tanks should not have had regimental integrity bonuses, so uh, that attack would have been even worse. I cheated. Oh well. Okay. Now for armor and anti-tank bonuses, um, I need to pick a armor lead unit. Um, I guess it'll be this guy here. It's got a uh, armor of four. Four. This guy's going to use his lead unit. Four minus four is zero. So there's no bonus either way. It's too bad. So this, these, these guys are good for canceling out uh, armor bonuses. Uh, so that's good to know. Uh, then uh, proficiency. So I need to pick a proficient unit to lead the assault. Um, might as well. So that's a, that's the guy that's going to take the first loss. So maybe I'll pick like this guy who I don't really care too much about compared to the other guy anyway. So we'll pick this. That's leading the assault. Seven minus. Um, I need to look that up. It's six. So seven minus six um, is one. So we get one more point. So the allies are looking at seven bonus points to their die roll. Now, um, there were some artillery shifts on this guy. I'm just taking them off because, you know, we're at max column anyway. It didn't really matter. Um, so we're going to go ahead and roll. Let's um, come back over here. Like, like usual, I will not do this every time, but just until we get the hang of this. Uh, green is the 10s. So 92 plus 7 is 99 for the attacker. Nice. Defender. Rolled a zero three, so that's three plus seven is ten. Um, which is interesting because ten zero to ten or ten actually causes a loss. Um, but if I had rolled higher, it would have come off the chart. Which kind of makes me think you should oh there's no zeros on here, but I did read in the rules somewhere that you can have zero. Hmm, I might have to double check on that. I may have screwed up on a couple of attacks, but let's just assume it's at ten. So defender's going to do one um, discretionary loss. The attacker at ninety nine is going to do three discretionary and three mandatory. Well, the three mandatory. Mandatory number one, this guy's gonna flip. Dead. Oh, actually, Z unit. And you cannot take more than one mandatory loss. So then the remainder, I will convert to retreats. So um, the only place to retreat to is this way. Um, and you know they're they're going to continue retreating, except they retreated adjacent to an enemy unit. And it says when you do that, you have to take an additional step loss. It says Z units cannot fulfill the step loss, but um, I think that is in terms of like if you have some real like full step unit, 
you can't use a Z unit when you have one of those. But so I'm reading this as like these guys are just dead. Um, okay, and then the attackers take a proficiency check. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's I was I'm wrong. That was a discretionary loss. So discretionary loss is a required retreat, or I can try to convert it into a uh, step loss. Now there's a ton of units attacking here, so I can't imagine they would all have to retreat one hex. So um, I'm going to do one little bit of research. Well, my reading is all the units that participated would have to retreat if they take a discretionary loss as a retreat. So I'm going to do a, pro a proficiency check. You have to do it on the lead proficiency unit, which was seven. So I need less than seven. Got a two. So I can convert that to a step loss. Um, which will have the first step loss will have to come from this guy with first and only so he flips okay and then uh, the defender vacated their hex so then we can advance and we have a lot of mech units here so we could do quite a bit of advancing uh, mech units can advance up to four hexes and my reading of the rules there is no like movement halts other than from fortifications so um, I'm inclined to just go one. You always have to go into the defender sex. One, two, three. Movement halt. Um, one, two, three. And then I want to get some infantry in there so I can get the com combined arms and not have this guy halved. So, um, one, two, three. Halt. Okay, and then um, one, two. I could go three if I wanted, but I'm just kind of stacking these guys up here. And then um, I would orchestrate the order of my advance so that I don't overstack, so I'll just go ahead and pretend I did that. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And then these guys would probably go one, two. Mm, do I want to cross over into the Canadian zone? I don't think so. We'll just kind of chill out here. Okay, I think I did that right. Okay, now for the final prepared assault. What do we have here? Um, this guy has two artillery shifts. Uh, oops, it's in a field work. Oh, he's in some woods with a village or maybe it was a location okay so what do we have coming in here we have lots of stuff so first off is infantry so we have combined arms with this AFV here so that's 11 um, 18 and then over here unfortunately I was probably dumb oh no cool lucked out so what was that? That was 18, um, 25, 35, 40, 44 coming in. Okay, the defender. Defender is just uh, two. So um, the terrain is woods, that is line um, we definitely have more than seven to one odds, so um, that's where we're going to be in this column here. Uh, line two, yeah, this column here. Now for uh, shifts. So uh, the defender is in a um, level two field work. And I think I missed this in some of the other combats. It kind of blends in with the text and the rules. Uh, that level two field work is two column shift. Okay. Um, the defending hex is not within combat reserve range. So the attacker cannot use combat reserve stuff. Um, I guess I'm doing that a little early because I'm just doing odd shifts right now. 
Um, one thing I didn't pay attention to, there are two formations attacking. There's the guards and the 3rd infantry. They're the 79th armored attached, but uh, that that's fine. So uh, that's a one column shift for the extra formation. Uh, negative. Uh, this isn't looking very good. Um, there's no overstack units, no adjacent defenders, nope. Um, there are engineers, so maybe they can cancel out the field works. There's lots of engineers. Okay, yeah, so each engineer cancels a shift, so let's shift back two. Okay, and then there are artillery shifts. There's two artillery shifts, and we go off the edge there. And uh, so we are at max, co max um, column again. Now for die roll modifiers, um, so there's no combat reserve. Um, is the regimental integrity? I'm skimming the units right now. There is not. Um, Anti-tank and armor, so I keep forgetting to say this, but we'll just assume, if I don't say it, armor is not in standoff mode. So we have armor, so I need to pick a lead armor unit. Um, go ahead and pick this middle... Yeah, we'll pick this engineer flail tank with four. Okay, so um, four minus zero is four, but then we need to make some mods. Um, where is that chart? Somewhere in here, here we go. Um, so we're in woods, that'll be minus two, so it brings it down to two, and then entrenchment level two, minus two. And it uh, looks like engineers don't affect it, so we're at zero, and so there is no armor bonus. Um, proficiency bonus, we'll go ahead and use this tank here. So what I want, and we'll use this infantry here as the proficient unit. 7 minus something I can't remember. 7 minus 6 is 1. So there's going to be a bonus of 1 in the allies' favor. Um, that looks to be it, so that's not that great. Okay, let's hop over here. Roll the die. Doing the green die is the 10s. That is not good. That's a 14. Plus one. Um, 14 plus one is 15. So it's a one, 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 uh, mandatory and discretionary. And then the defender, it's uh, 82 plus one, so it's 83. It's off the chart, which means nothing, I believe. So uh, one, one, uh, one mandatory hit. Boom, dead. So, not much to do there. Um, getting a little clean up here. Okay, so, uh, ooh, field work. Field work, maybe that could have taken the hit. Let's set this stuff back up here. Okay, so an entrenchment, or a, yeah, entrenchment level two, for example, can take a discretionary hit. It cannot take a mandatory hit. So, boom. Okay, and once a f one of these is unoccupied, it's gone. Okay, so next we want to advance. It's not very far we can advance, because right here is a um, entrenchment. Though, if the defender's destroyed outright, you can advance into an adjacent hex, which is interesting. So maybe we'll do that. Maybe this entire stack will advance over here, and this entire stack will advance down here. That ends the ground assault segment. So now we enter the allied exploit segment. This is where units uh, marked for exploitation uh, can move up to half their movement um, allowance and conduct overruns if they so desire. An overrun is basically you um, engage in combat one unit at a time by moving, you pay an extra movement point into an enemy location. And you can even move through the enemy and you know out, out behind them because you're overrunning them. Um, so they either get destroyed or survive and you can keep on going. So um, since it is an attack and it's only one unit at a time though, I kind of looked at all the units that are kind of within range of these guys and 
you know, they're all fairly tough. Uh, so, for example, there's six defense there in a city, right? And what do we have here? Well, we have some tough tanks. Uh, that's a 15 attack there. Um, but into a city, if you recall, it was pretty tough attacking with three tanks. So one tank doing an overrun is probably, uh, I'm thinking, not going to be what I want to do. But I can at least move them forward. Um, so we'll go ahead and remove this exploitation marker here. And this guy's movement factor is six. And um, I'm not really going to count the movement factors because it's so close. They can just move right in. So um, yeah, I think we'll come in like this. Hmm. I'd like to keep these guys stacked together, actually. So we can try to get some uh, integrity bonuses. So maybe I'll throw them over here. Um, Let's see, so I don't want to get halted by moving adjacent to an enemy uh, entrenchment here, so we'll just go one into clear, one into clear again, so that's two. We can go uh, six. Um, we're going along a secondary road, um, three. Let's see, it connects over here, four. Let me make sure it does connect. I think it does. No. So we'll go, uh, um, let's see, what is a city? A city for mechanized movement is three. So I went, let's see, one, two, three. Well, that would use all my movement to go there. Let me just scan this a little closer. Yeah, there's no roads going that way. So, um, okay, maybe I'll do this. Uh, one, two, three. Now I'm on the roads going this way. Four. And then um, we'll go ahead and go four. Five, I think the roads connect there. Yes, they do. So we'll go five to there. This guy will hop over five. So they went half their movement factors there. Now this guy here, similar. He's from the same formation. Um, so we'll go one, two, three, four. And uh, due to stacking, he can't go in there. Might as well stack with this guy. Five, is that what I want? Yes, that's fine. Okay, and I'm not doing overruns there. So then uh, the other guy that we had in exploit mode. Um, so he can go seven. It's a mech unit. Um, it's a recon unit. Um, I, I think he's just too weak to try to overrun these guys. So um, he'll just go move further down. Um, we'll go one. Let's see, these are trails now. A trail. Um... Looking up on the chart, it's one, costs one to go on a trail, or 1.5, I guess, if there's terrain. So um, there's no terrain here. So we went one, two. Now, what can I get in here? Um, yeah, there's no room. So I guess he'll just, these guys will just scooch forward a little bit. Uh, well, that was uneventful. So um, that ends the Allied Exploit segment. So then we go into the Allied Administrative Phase, which consists of a couple segments. One is the Ammo Replenishment Segment. That's where we replenish depleted artillery units. So um, for this scenario, it's not explicitly spelled out, but um, based on the rules of ammo depletion, which uh, I haven't talked about, um, that's from artillery barrages. Your artillery basically can be deplete their art ammo reserves. Um, it doesn't seem applicable for this scenario because we're tracking um, basically a bunch, you know, the firepower of each artillery unit and they're all combined into groups and it just doesn't make sense based on the rules for ammo depletion. So we'll skip that. And then um, fatigue recovery segment. Well, there are no fatigued allied units. I, if I recall correctly, there might be a fatigued um, German unit here or there, but uh, that ends the allied player turn for turn one. Now, uh, that allied turn was pretty long, uh, over two hours it seems. So uh, I'm going to do what I don't normally like to do, which is to split a turn across two videos. It's just too long. So um, the German turn will be in the next uh, segment, um, the next video. Catch you later.